Listen to the child who listens to the waves sneak upon the sands which grate against the grander pebbles which shape around the sharper rocks which break our view beyond the block. Listen to the girl who has her own world feel the song of the earth form. Salt waters shyly push their way slightly into an impending high tide. A gentle nudge to say time will move on without me. Hi, I'm Madeleine Piggott and I'll be answering some questions about Le Monteur for this edition of PLU Presents. Great, so who and what is Le Monteur? Le Monteur is the annual arts magazine associated with the University of Kent's Paris School of Arts and Culture. Each year, as a new cohort of students arrives to undertake their master's degree, a new peer-voted editorial team is created for Le Monteur, who then collectively decide the theme for that year's magazine. Uh, this year I was voted in as editor-in-chief for the magazine and our team is made up of an arts editor, a poetry editor, two fiction editors, a non-fiction editor, a designs team and a communications team. Each year our call for submissions is open to all writers, artists and uh, mixed media artists, uh, no matter where you are or where you're based. Uh, we often receive many international submissions, um, although we do get a lot of submissions from Kent students themselves and also ex-members of Le Montour team. How did you come up with this year's theme, Art Rewired? Well, I studied English literature for my undergraduate degree and I'm currently studying art history, so I've become really interested in the relationship between the arts. When thinking about the theme this year, I was inspired by the fact that the word for text and the word for textile come from the same Latin root, which is textilis, which means to weave. By discussing the interweaving and collaboration of the arts with the team, we settled on Art Rewired, as we wanted to incorporate these ideas with the highly technologically based interactions that we find ourselves relying upon due to COVID. What importance has collaboration had for you and your creative process? Uh, collaboration isn't something that I'm just interested in from an academic perspective. It plays an important part in many of the personal projects that I'm undertaking at the moment. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with the rest of the Montour team. Whilst we were already engaged in cooperative projects, our collaboration with PLU has really inspired us to engage even more with our artists this year than normal. Uh, the Montour is normally just a printed magazine, but this year we've become a virtual space where our artists and writers can not only present their art, but also themselves. How has Le Montour developed over the last 12 months? Have you looked at different ways the magazine can express itself or take on a new medium? In a world stalled by COVID-19 restrictions, our magazine, like so many other projects, has been entirely reliant upon technology. Our annually elected team has used this as an opportunity to reach out to more diverse artists and build online relationships not only with them, but between the team members themselves. While certainly a challenge, uh, it has also been an, insp an inspiration to see Le Montour living its theme like never before, undertaking new partnerships and introducing new performative and discursive elements into the ever-expanding folds of the magazine. Where can we view Le Montour this year? So, previous editions of The Montour can be seen on issue at The Montour. Um, our magazine launches in June, so if you follow any of our social media pages, we have Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, all at The Montour. Um, there'll be more information about our launch when the new magazine is coming out, and there'll also be an online event which you can sign up for. When the lockdown started in March last year. Suddenly everything went underground. On the surface, the streets were empty. Everything, the culture, the conversation, the, the art of any kind, uh, the whole life went <clears throat> below the surface. So that, and also the fact that we today, at any given moment, thanks to some form of technology we have on ourselves, are actually constantly connected to that digital underground that is running under the surface of the 
ordinary life on the streets. The streets now are a lie. What is happening is actually happening in virtual reality. That fact and the fact that physically we were living underground reminded me uh, very much, I thought that the feeling was the same or very similar to the feeling that the early Christians had in the catacombs of Rome. That feeling that on the surface nothing is happening in your life. You are a servant or a slave or, or something um, similar, but you know better. You are connected to other people like you. And so uh, that was a very similar feeling. So I started drawing my little daily diary in the form of digital illustrations combined with um, small pieces of poetry or just general thoughts or comments. And I called it Diary of Narrow Days because suddenly everything became narrow. Also, once um, for about two years, I lived in Belgrade in a room that was so narrow that when I stretched my arms, I would touch both side walls. The window in that room was um, on the small wall. And so if I wanted to see the outside world, I would have to go and I would have to look in that direction, which forced me to see the perspective of the walls. And I think this situation of narrow days that we have lived during the past year has actually forced us to view life through that perspective, to become aware of the perspective. I was thinking that, you know, my, um, my little digital um, pencil, pen, whatever you call it, would be able to connect me with that underground where my people were, my friends, like a dart flying towards somebody, something, somewhere, because that's what art does. Hits other people with sharp objects. This poem is called Deal. I have spoken to the ambassadors of imaginary landscapes. We signed the treaties separating waters from wines. We arranged for respectful silence. We are currently seeking innocent victims. Black forest. Nothing you say matters. It snows all morning. The cold assaults me with tedious, indifferent gaze. Light before proper light. Alone, maybe not alive. Flat edges against backdrop. Cricket stirring in the grass. Breaking the night open. Sharp, Sharp size, size of the moon. moon. Crisp, red as pomegranate. Available fruit. Ashy fireplace crackles, drying off soft skin. Soggy mulch mattress, letting the mud in. Cutting the day short. Up in cold dawn, scraping potatoes in a cloth. Small, Small hand, hand, middle finger like a feeler. A spider searching homestead. Smell carries in your neck, hair, clothes, deliciously, deliciously sour. sour. Fading as wind drags clouds to the sea. Golden aching parting. Twilight in reverse, wheat kissing the sky. On the, On the platform, platform, a cabbage, cabbage white. White. Are we going the same way? Single reasonable season. Called at night by milky light. In the, in the greenhouse, greenhouse, fingers in warmer. I hope you're doing, doing well. well. Doing well. Releasing a dandelion spur. I don't see it land. Petal rain dusting, 
baffron pollen over before intense heat. Gold, Gold hangs, hangs on, on everything. everything. Now, now and, and then, then, now and then, turning, turning to snow. snow. I'm Stephanie O'Brien and I'm a musician from London living in Paris. My line drawings began essentially as a spontaneous moment between a friend. Um, she'd come to visit me for the weekend and before she left I really wanted to capture a moment between us. So we grabbed a piece of paper that was to hand, some pencils and I set down the rules. I said, we're going to do portraits of each other, but we're not going to look at the page while we do it. And we're not going to overthink it. We're just going to draw what we see in about a minute. So she picked purple, I picked blue, and we began. And after about a minute, when we felt like we were ready, it was time to reveal our work. And in fact, what I loved about this whole experience was the process. Um, we weren't thinking too much and we were really just enjoying this connection uh, between each other, looking intently at each other, eye to eye. And at the end, it was time to reveal our work and <laughs> we turned the pages around and we just burst into laughter because the pictures, of course, look absolutely absurd. And the whole experience was, for me, really humbling because as a creative, we're often so driven by perfectionism and trying to create something perfect or often thinking about the end result. And in fact, this experience just reminded me to reconnect with a sense of play and freedom and that space to express yourself um, without thinking about the parameters around you. Um, so I loved this project and this idea of creating these fluid drawings for pleasure. It's almost like a meditation. Um, this project developed when I went on the road with some friends in 2019. In fact, they became my friends, but initially we didn't know each other and we were embarking on a three month tour um, internationally and I used this idea, this, this approach to in, in fact create um, a more immediate connection than I might have had with them. Um, we were sharing the same bus for months on end and it was a great, a great way to kind of break the ice and make a really deep connection, um, share laughter, share something really unique. Um, in a very quick and immediate and spontaneous way. So I documented uh, our time together on tour and each person arrived with, I think, five or six different depictions. I remember grabbing just a few moments uh, backstage, sometimes when I was longing to be with my family or my friends back home, because, you know, when you're touring, you go through these prolonged periods of absence and, and you feel a sense of longing. And sometimes that brings you to a place of detachment in your mind. And in fact, using these drawings as a vehicle was an amazing way to bring me right back to the present and engaging with the amazing people that are around me. Um, so I have this wonderful collection of drawings um, of that time together and it wasn't just me that was doing the drawing um, we would often swap and they'd experience it for themselves and I think everybody found something in it and since that time I've continued it and I have plans to develop the project um, perhaps into um, the realms of music um, and of course continue with the line drawings as well but if you haven't tried this I recommend to everybody pick up a pen pick up a piece of paper, connect with your environment, connect with the person that's in front of you, engage with what you see and see how it makes you feel.
Hello, my name is Isabel Pedrazuela, and my piece, The King's Portrait, is going to be published in the ZS edition of The Mentor. When I heard about the theme for the magazine, Art Rewired, I was very inspired by it, because I'm really interested in the relationship between artists. And I also love to see how the artist's personality and what they have been through in life can play a big role in their art. In my story, I decided to talk about two painters, Diego de Velázquez and Peter Paul Rubens. They were both very different and have lived in different parts of the world. For instance, Diego had been born in Spain, in Seville, and then he moved to Madrid, where he painted for the king. Peter Paul was born in Flanders, and he painted all across Europe for very different kinds of people. However, at some point in their careers, they met, because they were both asked to paint the same piece. They were both asked to paint a portrait of the king of Spain, King Philip. When I saw both of the paintings, I was very surprised to see how different they were. I realized that the painters had been looking at the same person, but each of them had seen a different king, and this was visible in, the, in their paintings. As a writer, I have experienced similar things. For instance, when I was thinking about the theme for this year's edition of the magazine, I soon had an idea of what it meant to me, but I know that other artists may have a different interpretation of the word rewired. The King's Portrait is the first of my story that is going to be published, and I am very excited to see how it fits the magazine. I look forward to seeing how other artists have chosen to interpret the theme and how all of the pieces work together as a whole. I miss unstaged interaction, conversation off screen where light and movement is accidental, dependent on the elements, where I don't e invite you en masse into my home alone, where words are misheard due to music, traffic, not bad signal on my tablet. I miss capricious environments that turn a turn of phrase to a new direction. I want to sommeler les pinceaux, but not get our wires crossed. I want to mix our paints on a canvas I can touch. I don't want to rewire, I need to unwire, before my memories of creative connection unspool, and the only links are URLs. You are lonely, I tell myself. And yes, it feels like loneliness sometimes, but more often it is hunger for the hangover of having heard and seen, having been. Landscape. Landscape. The senses working together to provide the mindscape I use to breathe my brain. I miss the threads of shared experience that weave into a collective memory. The unpredictability of physical togetherness where there are so many voices I can't hear a thing, but I feel the moment as a sensorial overload so much that it becomes tangible when I write it later. Hang on a minute. I can't quite hear you. You are so distant down the line like a half promise. I can't quiet to this digital noise. I need to relearn the feel of your voice as it moves around a space. I can't rewire our connection. I don't want to. It is always about a dollar. I was given two kisses on the cheek before I left the city, before I left San Francisco. The first thing I saw when I exited the metal door was a man suffering. At this point in my life, 30 years old, I deserve a European woman. Why not? I learned all there is to know about them. I woke up intoxicated with egalitarianism. She, she serves me a cup of victory. I reached for my kisses made up of Lisbon evenings, full of working class blonde maids. I hope you find what you're looking for. Why did you come to this poor country? Is it always about a dollar? Better yet, no orgasms, sexually frustrated stares. We are sweaty and smell. Our people, Latin American from the Middle East, I even watched Israel confiscate 3 million olives last night. Does it matter what happens to you? 
in Yugoslavia, the women yell at you in the rain. Perhaps you will marry and forget about ethics. She told me she wanted to die because of winter-induced depression. We make love in an alleyway. A lover of mine will be classist. Even during this period of time, you know, their people will talk about George Floyd and they will make a big deal about it. They will light candles in Iran that I felt invincible and these days I prefer it that way. A beautiful woman is more important than equality. In other words, the true protagonist is you. This is both sides of racial and sexual stereotypes. The intellectual women are crying for no reason. That should be the most beautiful name for a woman. She then talks to me. Better yet, put away the guns. A drunk Muslim woman enters a bar and asks for a cigarette. She then talks about her love life. It is necessary for women to ask for permission to acknowledge that they have been oppressed, that this actually occur, that we will live years without knowing who our lovers will be. She said I was having nightmares and described it. And through parallel histories and teardrops and bad decisions down my throat, a woman's clavicle should be your sanctuary. That sincere people have failed to feel empathy and are just sedated by conformity. I was told by the taxi driver that they had a bloodless revolution. You won't be so arrogant when earthquakes remind you of your childhood. It is better to eat at the dinner table alone than to be mistaken for the last night of rebellion. I've made up my mind that I will only fall in love with women with beautiful voices. I hear your voice whispered softly by the breeze and reach out my hand to grasp the infinite and realize my place in time, clouds briefly parting, revealing the sky that lies behind with the Carolyn's song. Passing years scattered by the wind, passing clouds pierced by the sun, a bird ascending in still air. My hand reaches out. Your smile so far away. Time grasped. Time spent. Time wasted. time wished for. And the lingering question, I am here. You are there. And where does that leave me? Fear, patronage, struggle, confidence. These are the four stages of the artist played out on but a single solitary stage. Stage fright. 
anywhere can become a stage and at any moment. Some performances we rehearse for, others are impromptu. Nerves can only last for a moment before the curtain flies up and there is nowhere to run. Eyes endeavor to crush you with their weight. Will you rise? At your service. Is it not enough the desire to create? Or am I to be of service? Shall the great patrons of the state seek me out to execute their visions? Shall I be the local visionary, receiving requests for my renditions of realities and reveries? I can never create solely for myself, because I want eyes on the numerous alter egos I invent, that they may even simply peer into the world as I see it, and discuss with me when they are alone with their thoughts. Therefore, next to each creation, I shall doff my instrument and present myself simply saying, at your service. Yea or nay? I can do it. Thanks for the permission, I, I guess. But explain this to me, please. Why do I need it? Your approval changes like morality throughout history. I'll either be among the best or just not as good as you thought I was. So what do those words mean to me? Alone, Harati swearing his perilous oath. So, swear to attend the whole spectacle, or cede your place to memory. If you're not willing to risk getting caught in the occasional explosions of implosions, blank stares, blank pages, and self-loathing. I never promised to take you to another world, because I don't know who's willing to wait for me to defy and overcome gravity. They would rather stand on the shore and watch me try to break the waves of tribulation. Each time I fall will erode the crowd, no longer willing to watch a potential suicide. And they will simply say they were wrong. That is approval. Whether yea or naysayers, that's just it. They're just saying. Subjectivity. Is it being done right? Is it being done wrong? Is it being done well? Is it being done poorly? Who tells me it is thus? What basis for judgment is there? Or are there no rules except those of the creator? But then, who are the masters of these crafts? Can anyone become a member of this guild? Or is everyone born with membership and free to do with it as they will? Who would need it? Rather, who would want it? Will you permit me to speak? Better yet, who are you to censor me? Who is nobody? Isn't anybody somebody? What is it worth? You mean, what is the truth worth? In order. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. No one ignorant of the process. There is none. Pretty much, the self-proclaimed, yes, yes, everyone, anyone. That was a rhetorical question. <sighs> Only death is so powerful. Nobody. Of course. Nothing. Everything. The curtain has risen. Enjoy the show. April is the cruelest month. Turn your head, turn around, turn right head into full one. Take Job. Solutions 
things are invisible Something's going down inside Bypassing accumulators to short circuits of the night I'm asking for forgiveness, brother, can I get a witness to sign? When we sing about the times of surprise